The Biology of Tribalism. Hi there, my friend. My name is Taylor, and I am a former social worker. In this video, I want to give you very important information and resources on the biological underpinnings of human tribalism. I've derived this information primarily from the work and classes of Stanford University professor and neuroendocrinologist Robert Sapolsky, as well as many other scientists in the fields of clinical psychology and evolutionary biology. Let's start by briefly talking about the human brain. Many people might think that the brain is one single unit, but in reality, it is made up of several very distinct parts that have very specific functions. And these structures have evolved over the course of tens of millions of years. Many people might also think that they have 100% control over their brain functions. This is not true. Much of our brain functioning in day-to-day -day life is totally automatic and outside our conscious control. The part that I'd like to focus on in this video is called the amygdala, which does anger, aggression, and fear. The amygdala is located in the region of our brain called the limbic system, which is the part of our brain that primarily processes feelings. Here's Professor Sapolsky on the amygdala. With 80-year-old research, we've now landed in the limbic system. What are the subregions that are relevant? The area that comes in at the top of the list immediately that we've already heard a fair amount about is the amygdala. The amygdala and its role in fear, its role in anxiety, that strange role in males of sexual motivation. But what the amygdala is most renowned for is its role in aggression. And as I emphasized last week, it is mighty interesting, I think, that the part of the brain which is most responsive to when you are scared is the part of the brain that generates the starts of aggressive behavior. Again, in a world in which no neuron may be, need be afraid, we're going to have a lot fewer aggressive amygdalas out there. Amygdala. Amygdala is centrally involved in fear and anxiety. You know this already of tremendous significance telling us something about why this world is such a messed up place, the amygdala also plays a central role in aggression. Not messed up just because, ooh, this is the part of the brain that generates aggression, but what it tells you is you cannot understand the neurobiology of being violent without understanding the neurobiology of being afraid and being anxious. And the fact that this is the same part of the brain that does both of those functions, suggesting on a certain neurobiological level, in a world in which no neurons need be afraid, you're not going to be generating a whole lot of aggression. Just like you cannot control the speed of your own heartbeat, the amygdala is part of our brain that we cannot consciously control. Think about it. Are you able to consciously control your fear when you are scared? Are you able to consciously and instantly turn off your irritability when annoyed or cranky? If you are a human being, then my guess is probably not. But aside from anger, fear, and aggression, the amygdala does something else. It is the home of our primate us versus them operating system a topic that I covered extensively in my first video. Okay, another thing that the amygdala is brilliant at, which we will come back to in more detail, but on a first pass is so depressing, is the amygdala is probably the part of your brain that is best at doing dichotomizing between us and them, forming categories in group, out group, and responding to out group stimuli. When I describe us versus them as an operating system, I'm not talking about the kind that you would use with a computer, but rather I'm talking about the instinctual system that is ingrained in the biology of a living animal 
that facilitates its operation in the world around it. For example, most birds have a basic operating system that instinctively causes individual birds to fall into flocks. Hooved mammals like zebras, cows, deer, and elk instinctively fall into herds. Canines instinctively fall into packs. And primates, like humans, instinctively fall into tribes. And because of this inbuilt tribalism, human primates have the tendency to see people in their in-group as good, but to see anybody in an out-group as bad. When I say in-group and out-group, what I'm talking about is the tendency that we have to group up with people who share many of the same physical characteristics, ideas, and beliefs that we have, but to maintain distance from and be nervous around people who look different than us, have different ideas, and hold different beliefs. Chapter 11 of Dr. Sapolsky's book entitled Behave, the biology of humans at our best and worst, is dedicated to this us versus them nature, where he outlines many more of the biological us versus them impulses all human beings possess, including the predispositions to cooperating better with others in your in-group, to passionately empathize with the group's hardships, to come to their defensive assistance if needed, and sometimes, in dire circumstances, to even sacrifice your own life for the in-group. However, some consequences of this biology are that we see people in out-groups as strangers, parasites, and moral threats. We are passively suspicious of anyone in an out-group, we strongly dislike listening to out-group ideas and perspectives, and we are likely to feel extremely competitive with anyone in an out-group. I've heard many people say that racism is in our DNA. However, I would propose that a more accurate way of articulating this is that tribalism is in our DNA. Since human primates, us, evolved for millions of years in small tribal clan groups that were always in fierce, bloody competition with each other, it is deeply and unavoidably ingrained into our DNA and biology, and from an evolutionary perspective, it would make perfect sense that aggression, fear, and us versus them are controlled by the same part of our brain. Now, something that is very, very important to understand here is that because of this biology, we are programmed to become unconsciously and automatically afraid of people that our brains think are different than us. Check out these clips of Dr. Sapolsky. Very disturbing work. Work done by a number of labs over the years, most notably uh, Elizabeth Feltz, who is at NYU. And this is work using functional brain imaging, amygdala, all of that. You put people in a brain scanner, actually you put one in, and you put them in one at a time. And what you do is you're flashing up pictures to them flashing up pictures of people, of faces, of faces at a rapid speed, so there's virtually no conscious processing. This is all tapping into subliminal stuff, and what she reported, and what has been replicated by another, a number of other groups since then, is that you get activation of the amygdala on the average in people when you subliminally flash up pictures of somebody of another race. There's some incredibly hardwired stuff going on. Flash up faces of people that 
somebody has categorized as either an in-group or an out-group, and in a fraction of a second, your brain is differentiating between them. If it's a them, parts of your brain that are related to fear, aggression, disgust, activate. Parts of your brain that normally process faces don't activate as much as normal. Parts of your brain related to empathy don't activate as much as normal if it's a them. We've got this gigantic fault line in our heads as to who counts as an in-group member, who evokes empathy, who evokes concern, and who's a them who just gets us bristling. Another very important part of the brain that is relevant to this topic is called the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is the part of our brain that does gratification postponement, long-term planning, and most importantly, the inhibition of the amygdala. The inhibition of anger, fear, aggression, and tribalism. The most interesting area of the cortex, a region called the frontal cortex, also known as the prefrontal cortex. This is a part of the cortex which is intimately interconnected with all these subcortical regions. It is arguably the cortical component of the limbic system. The frontal cortex has this world of utterly uncortex-like things that it's interested in emotional regulation, impulse control, long-term planning, gratification postponement, Frontal cortex is what makes us most definedly human. It is proportionately larger in humans than in any other species. It is the most recently evolved. Something that we will hear about in coming weeks is it's the last part of the brain to fully mature. And this instead is a cortical area utterly intertwined with what's going on in the limbic system. What this also means is that the more active your amygdala becomes, the less influence your prefrontal cortex will have over your mind and body. In other words, the more you are caught up in your feelings, the less you are able to think clearly as an individual and more likely to behave impulsively like a predictable pack-oriented animal. Furthermore, one of the most important facts that I want you to take away from this video is that the prefrontal cortex does not finish developing until the age of 25. Okay, so now frontal cortex looking at one of its most distinctive interesting things about its function, its development. When does it develop after birth? And I think what I've already mentioned is the frontal cortex is interesting because it's the last part of your brain to fully develop. It is the last part of your brain to fully form all of the myelin on its axons. It's the last part to get its full large complement of synapses and branching connections and such. It's the last part of the brain to develop. When does the frontal cortex, on the average, completely mature, go online for the first time? Around age 25, which is astonishing, which among other things uh, should be reckoned in the context that probably all sorts of you guys still have a whole lot more myelin to lay down there in the frontal cortex. It is the last part of the brain to fully develop. Some immediate imp implications of that, if it is the last part of the brain to develop, it is by definition the part of the brain least constrained by genes. And it is the part of the brain most sculpted by environment and experience, which is real interesting given that it is the most definedly human part of the brain. If you've ever wondered why so many high schoolers die in tragic accidents, this is one of the biggest reasons, since they do not yet have the part of their brain that does long-term planning and long-term consequences. Moreover, since it's the part of the brain that is least influenced by genes and most influenced by the environment, very specific kinds of education and socialization are not optional if you want someone to develop the capacity to resist the primal impulses of anger, fear, 
aggression and tribalism emanating from their amygdala. I would propose that huge numbers of people, especially people under the age of 25, have been hijacked by their amygdala. People who have been hijacked by their amygdala will display things like rapid onset of irritability, anger, crankiness, and fear. Rapid onset of severely strong paranoia and extremely hostile feelings to anyone they perceive to be in an out group. Black and white, all or nothing, polarized thinking, as in, if you've seen one, you've seen them all, and you're either with me or against me. Inability to use thinking or reasoning faculties to consider nuanced positions. Inability or refusal to view self or others as individuals. Forcing loyalty oaths on others and breaking friendships and family bonds due to perceived ideological impurity, which is the result of cultish tribal behavior and obsession with ideological cleanliness. Another symptom that I've been noticing is psychological projection. Projection is the psychological tendency of our brains to unconsciously project unwanted thoughts, feelings, and impulses about ourselves onto another person or group. For example, someone who is habitually rude may constantly accuse others of being rude. Some people who are frightened by strong homosexual feelings that they find repugnant can become homophobic and vocally against homosexuality. I suspect that at least some of those who are most vocal in rejecting thoughts, concepts, or feelings that they find repugnant are secretly scared that they hold those same thoughts, concepts, or feelings. When I see people who are feverish in labeling others as racists, anarchists, Nazis, socialists, cucks, or supremacists, I at least entertain the possibility that they themselves have been frightened by seeing these things within themselves. So with all this in mind, what are some possible solutions to this? How can we quell and reduce these runaway tribal feelings? One possible solution can be found in this unbelievably important insight from Dr. Sapolsky's class. And this has predominantly been researched by Susan Fisk at Princeton. Get people to start thinking categorically. Here's what you do. She would now have people going in there saying, I'm going to give you a bunch of pictures, flashing of pictures, and what I want you to do is to stop. I'm going to stop at some of them, and I want you to look closely and tell me, do you think this person is older than age 30 or younger than age 30? In other words, what you have just requested the person to do is think of the face in the picture as belonging to a category rather than as an individual. You're going to look at this picture now, and you don't really need to care who the person is or what they look like or anything like that. All you need to do is think of them as part of a category. And when you bias people like that, and you flash up the picture of somebody from another race, the amygdala gets even more activated. You have primed somebody to think not about individuals, but to make them think of people in categories. What this means is that thinking of someone in terms of a category like their skin color, for example, activates the amygdala. Now, listen to this. Now what she does is prime something, a totally neutral sort of priming, to try to get people to think of the person in the picture as an individual. 
and she asks totally innocuous, neutral things along the lines of, I want you to look at the picture. I know this sounds silly, but I want you to look at the picture and tell me, do you think, is this the kind of person who likes Coke or Pepsi? Totally sort of diagonal, orthogonal to all of this stuff. Get someone doing that, and now the amygdala doesn't activate. All you need to do in that study is subliminally prime someone to think of someone who they're about to look at as an individual rather than as part of a category, than as part of a group. This is not rebuilding society so that we change our us thems. This is a minor prompt 30 seconds before somebody has the pictures flashed at them. That's all it took in these studies. What this means is that if you prompt someone to look at someone else as an individual and not as a group member, then the part of our brain that does anger, aggression, fear, and us versus them does not activate. What this suggests is that a powerful way of ameliorating hyperactive aggression and tribalism is to simply encourage people to stop viewing other people as categorical identity group members and instead view them as individuals. Does it suggest that seeing others as individuals is a skill and not a naturally occurring thing? Remember what Dr. Sapolsky said about the prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that inhibits the amygdala. If it is the last part of the brain to develop, it is by definition the part of the brain least constrained by genes. And it is the part of the brain most sculpted by environment and experience, which is real interesting given that it is the most definedly human part of the brain. It's possible that unless we teach people how to see others as individuals, then they will not know how to do it and will default to more primitive and predictable animal instinct. Group versus group, us versus them, and they will be helpless against the primal feelings of anger, fear, aggression, and tribalism raging inside of them. If you detect signs in yourself that you are amygdala hijacked, as in irrationally angry or scared, thinking in polarized all or nothing ways, breaking friendships or family bonds over ideologies, I encourage you to consider viewing others as individuals and that they too might be suffering from an amygdala hijack. I've found that when I do this, I am able to move from anger with the other to pity. That may not sound like much, but it can be the first step to healing. One last thought that I'd like to share is that we must, as a society, remember that we are animals, specifically mammalian primates. We have been taught to hate and despise a part of our anatomy that is unfortunately automatic and unavoidable, and we cannot simply tell these impulses to go away. In fact, this inbuilt tribal nature and the functions of the amygdala remind me of pooping. Both are innate biological outputs that may not be pretty, but that we ignore at our own peril. Amygdala functions can be expressed in ways that are contained and sanitary or open and irresponsible, but they must be expressed nonetheless. To further the bodily function analogy, one can poop into a toilet or into a drinking water supply, but one cannot choose to do without defecation indefinitely. If we can't avoid expressing the functions of our amygdalae, then how can we avoid their harmful effects? 
Human societies have devised many solutions for this problem and continue to invent them. Here is a brief list of some activities which express or excite amygdala functions in a way that usually limit their worst aspects. Listening to, watching, or reading stories with protagonist narratives. Playing physical games, especially when competing against oneself or others. Sports, especially competitive sports. Playing video games, especially when they are kinetic, violent, or frightening. Creating or experiencing evocative art. And dancing, especially when partnered. But it's very important to remember that choosing to do without expressions of amygdala functions for prolonged periods does not result in the need for expression going away. It results in a more dramatic expression at a later time. It doesn't matter how hard you hold it in. It's eventually going to come out. Conclusions. The amygdala is the part of our brain that does anger, aggression, fear, and our tribal us versus them operating system, a pattern of responses inherent in our mammalian primate nature. This part of our brain is not under our direct conscious control. The prefrontal cortex, the part of our anatomy that does gratification postponement, long-term planning, and the inhibition of the amygdala does not fully develop in young humans until the age of 25. Huge numbers of people, especially those under the age of 25, seem as though they have been hijacked by their amygdala. This can be seen in their behaviors, such as rapid onset of anger, fear, aggression, paranoia, pathological tribalism, or racism. It is not unreasonable to wonder if some of those who are using amygdala-associated methods of pointing out problems, like shouting, screaming, or violence, may be engaged in projection. They might secretly harbor problems similar to the ones that they are pointing out in those ways. The people in politics and the media who are encouraging the population to see itself as a battlefield of homogenous, tribal identity groups have absolutely no idea the scope and magnitude of the danger that they are placing all of us in. The darkest and most genocidal moments of our history were born out of these primate impulses, and I am very concerned about what the future looks like if we allow them, let alone encourage them, to continue amplifying and growing. To counteract this mass hijacking by one of our most primitive and dangerous brain regions, we must educate and train people about the biological implications and power of seeing others as individuals and engaging in regular, healthy, amygdalic expression. People who think that racism and tribalism are somehow limited to only a select group of people or individuals have clearly never been educated in human behavioral biology. And because of this, I believe this is a topic that everybody should learn as soon as possible. My friend, please, please check out Dr. Sapolsky's book, Behave, The Biology of Humans at Our Best and Worst, as well as his class on human behavioral biology, which is available for free on YouTube. 
I also invite you to check out the first video I made a few months ago that touched on many of the same topics that I've discussed in this video. In it, I discuss how I strongly suspect that mental illness and powerful, purposeful, addictive mechanics present in social media algorithms are key factors in the amplification of aggression and tribalism in millions of people. In today's world, modern people consume data and information that is only two weeks old, leaving them isolated from this unbelievably crucial scientific information. I implore you to share this video along with Dr. Sapolsky's book and class with your friends, family, and loved ones in the hopes that we can stop ourselves from descending into tribal madness.